If you grew up playing video games like I did, you've probably heard lots of conflicting information. Some say too much gaming will ruin your vision and rot your brain, while others claim it improves your hand-eye coordination and can even make you smarter. So what exactly does gaming do to our brain and our body? To find out, I visited doctors and researchers. We're seeing brain activity in different frequencies. Tested my hand-eye coordination against a pro gamer. You can't catch up. And somehow ended up in a sub 200 degree cryo chamber. Woo! All to answer the question, how do video games affect us? The stakes are higher than ever. The industry is booming. Esports have gone mainstream. There are college leagues. Parents are even getting video game tutors for their kids. And thanks in part to smartphones and free games like Fortnite, gamers are playing more than ever before. So given that we can play virtually anywhere at any time, how is all this gaming changing us physically? Let's start with the excuse I used to give my mom when I was trying to get a little bit more time on the Atari. It's making me a better athlete. To find out if that's actually true, I headed to the Sports Academy in Thousand Oaks, California, where amateur gamers and esports pros train under the same roof as traditional athletes. This is pro gamer Matt Higginbotham. I'm known online as Acadian. Between training and casual gaming, Matt plays eight to 10 hours a day. People say, you know, it improves hand-eye coordination, it improves response time, kind of what have you seen in your own life? If you only play League of Legends, that's like your only activity with no physical exercise, in my opinion, you're just gonna get out of shape. In terms of positives, yeah, maybe, maybe cognitive. It would increase the things that you're gonna use in the game. Reacting to things quickly, making decisions quickly. So is he right? Let's find out if being an avid gamer actually makes you sharper. We're gonna be taking a bunch of cognitive tests, one after the other now. Matt is a pro gamer, I am very much not. So we're gonna see exactly how our results break down. The first test is my new arch nemesis, the DynaVision board, which tests pure reaction time. Your job is to hit the button when it lights up red, okay? It's gonna move pretty quickly. Okay. So, <laughs> so you're gonna to wanna to rely on your periphery. Okay. I can use either hand, right? You can use either oh, hand, Oh, this is right. gonna be a mess, I can already tell. Now, Matt's calm, and he's making it look easy, but this is way, way harder than it looks. Uh, am I not seeing one? Ah. Yep, down below, yeah. There you go. I just threw the whole test. Oh. It's pretty fun, actually. Damn it! I'm gonna walk you over to the next Okay, yes, yeah, so let's leave this Dynaboard. far behind. Yeah. I'll see you in hell, Dynaboard. The next one tests what's called cognitive processing under load. It's also a reaction test, but unlike the DynaVision board, there's a voice telling you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do. Okay, there's gonna be a voice in your headset now that says stop and go. Okay, don't listen to that voice. Keep hitting green. My brain. Yeah, it's tiring, right? The body gets fatigued and uh, so does the brain. That's crazy. The last test measures your ability to track multiple objects at the same time. We had to keep tabs on certain spheres as they floated around in a 3D space, kind of like trying to win two games of three-card Monty at the same time. Four, seven. Three and five. Six and eight. I got better at it after like eight of them. No, they bounced off each other. No. No. <laughs> I totally lost them. Um, My confidence is shaken at this point. Moment of truth. How are you? Let's how are see you? how I did. I hope you got some good news for of me. Of course, always. <laughs> These tasks are built to really push your cognitive processing, but, but at the same time give you measurable results and, and immediate feedback. Matt outperformed you in the more complex tasks. So as tasks got more complicated and had a significant amount of distractions and opportunity for the brain to start thinking about something that wasn't primary to the task, he outperformed you pretty significantly at those tasks. If we were to compare both your scores to a normal population of which we have data, he's in the 98th percentile and you're probably in the 60th or 70th percentile. So are we talking about self-selection here? Is, is it that people who are good at this stuff are playing games, or is there proof that games can actually improve your cognition in that way? No, I, I think for sure games can help improve your cognition. Playing video games can be very high speed, can create a lot of chaos, create a lot of multiple environments where you have to make decisions, and all of these are forming skills in the brain. So no, I, I, I think in general, just like in every capacity of human performance, we all start with some baseline based on genetics, but the opportunity to train cognition, I think is really powerful. Okay, so a pro gamer who's 20 years younger than me beat me at a few cognitive tests. I mean, of course he did. But what does science have to say about all this? 
video games is a hugely broad category. Um, and we know for sure that um, the impact of a game has to do with what you're asked to do. Um, so because of that, different games will have different impacts on, on the brain. You know, you wouldn't ask what's the impact of food on your body. Um, you don't want to know the composition of the food, right? Um, and so the same is true of video games. So, um, you know, depending on what we would call the mechanics, the dynamics, the content of individual games, that is what would predict how the games will affect your brain. Action games like Counter-Strike, Overwatch, and Fortnite are some of the most popular with consumers these days. And Green and his colleagues looked at games like those to find out what their impact is. There are a subtype of games, action games, that have been linked with positive effects in perceptual and cognitive skills. These are games that have lots of fast motion in them, lots of objects to track simultaneously, um, an emphasis on peripheral processing, so items first come at the edges of the screen. Um, the need to make quick and accurate decisions under time pressure. Based on 15 years worth of studies, researchers have found that action games' biggest positive effects were on perception, how our senses interpret external stimuli like sights and sounds, spatial cognition, which helps you orient yourself in and navigate 3D environments, and top-down attention, the ability to focus on one object while ignoring distractions. How far that generalizes, I think, is a pretty open question. So my expectation is that there are plenty of people who show pretty exceptional hand-eye coordination with a joystick might not be able to catch a baseball very well, right? Um, and so um, it's certainly the case that um, you know, perceptual motor skill development in one area won't necessarily generalize to all areas. I'm curious about thoughts that you have about the thresholds uh, between benefits gained from action games and where those diminishing returns might kick in. You will get more learning gain from smaller sessions spread out over time than one big block. With respect to perceptual and cognitive skills, um, we've either seen a positive impact or a null impact. We haven't seen any area that has been damaged where there is worse performance. So those are the positive effects of playing action games. But what if you could develop games that specifically harness those cognitive effects? That's exactly what researchers are attempting at UCSF's Neuroscape Lab. Our goal is to bridge technology and neuroscience to improve the function of your brain. The reason we focus on cognitive control is because we look at it as a very sort of base of the pyramid, that all other aspects of cognition, like memory or reasoning, decision making, all the way up to things like wisdom, um, are dependent upon it. If you can't pay attention, everything crumbles, right? You can't build any of the higher order cognitive abilities. They're custom designing games that could one day be prescribed as a kind of digital medicine for patients with conditions like ADHD. So where pharmaceutical medicines deliver molecular treatments, we think of this medicine as a digital medicine that delivers experiential treatments. The video game is essentially like our pill. They hooked me up with an EEG cap so that I could see my brain activity in real time while playing a steering game uh, called Project Evo. Evo. Okay. And we'll see your brain responding to it. And there are signs it's working. But there you go. You got it now. So that game is now in the FDA approval process to become the first ever prescribable video game. What we have frequently found is that we're able to get transfer of benefits from gameplay to other aspects of attention that are very different than the game. Neuroscape is also experimenting with virtual reality. Because VR can utilize your whole body as a controller, it may well be able to compound the benefits for things like attention and memory. A lot of data has shown that physical activity, even devoid of cognitive challenges, has positive benefits on your brain, especially the aging brain. So we ask the question, what happens if you give physical challenges that are integrated with cognitive challenge and create a sort of integrated approach um, Will you have even more cognitive benefits if you're moving your entire body, embodied challenges, as opposed to playing that same game just sitting there, just moving your fingers? And we're testing that right now. Now, despite your findings and despite the, the fact that you've been able to replicate this and you're in phase three uh, trials, there doesn't seem to be consensus in the medical community. There are a lot of other scientists who say, well, no, I mean, any, any positives that you can derive from games are kind of mild and transitory at best. How do you respond to that?
it's a complicated field and it's still early days. I'm at least cautiously optimistic based on what we've seen over the last 10 years that we're really on to something that's going to be very positive for people and using video games as a therapeutic. And if these games are prescribed one day to improve brain function, there are still questions about what the dosage should be. It is important to make it fun, but it is also critical to think of it as something that's dosed and played for a limited time and not interfering with the other important activities in your life. Okay, now for the bad news. Avid gaming can lead to injuries. I see many people who have repetitive motion injuries from gaming extensively. You know, many gamers will game from eight to 16 hours a day, six or seven days a week. So my goal when I'm talking to them, finding out how much they game, which games that they're playing, and what are their injuries. So the injuries are the following. Often finger injuries, wrist injuries, elbow injuries, shoulder injuries, neck injuries. It's the wide gamut of the human body, really. Dr. Harrison also sees something he calls gamer's thumb. And this is an issue whereby someone will have tendonitis, the back of their thumb, as well as on the volar aspect or palmar aspect of their thumb. So they'll have pain the back of the thumb and the front. Now that I've only seen with gamers. When they present with that, they have really abused their bodies. Their thumbs are really on fire. When this bad boy is down, then you got, you got a problem. Oh, so I'm here. I'm yes. your patient. Yes, Peter. Uh, I don't have big problems yet, but I want to prevent problems. So let me show you like, uh, let's say five basic stretches. So you're gonna go down and then bring your fingers up. You feel that? Mm -hmm. And loosen up your joints as well as for your wrists to, to start opening up everything and to get everything moving really nicely. In and out with the thumb, right? Then down. This is one of the fundamental stretches that every gamer should do. Console base, keyboard base, mouse, whatever. That is the thumb. The, the, you want to have a healthy thumb. And you do them for five to 10 minutes twice a day. Not difficult. I think video games are, are great. Moderation is the key. If you overdo it, then uh, there are always issues that will be attached to that. Look, there's no question that gaming can wear you out. Some gamers at the Sports Academy even subject themselves to cryotherapy after long sessions. The jury's still out on its effectiveness, but some players swear by it. So I decided to give it a try. All right, so there's freezing cold gas, it's dry. You go through this for two, two and a half, three minutes. When you come out, which I can only hope is gonna be sometime, woo, sometime soon, when you come out and your body starts to warm up again, your blood then starts to recirculate and it goes back out to your extremities and the idea being that the circulation feels amazing and you go to the surge of energy. All right. That was two and a half minutes, I made it. Oh, man. So oh, what have we learned here, other than the fact that I'm a masochist? Gaming can be good for your hand-eye coordination and perception. It can help with focus, attention, maybe even memory. Just how all that translates into the real world, though, is still up for debate. We also know that repetitive gaming can take a toll on your body, so a little bit of moderation goes a long way. When it comes to my own experience, I've played games for more than 30 years, never suffered any gaming-related injuries. And while I may never know if gaming helped my brain, I do know it didn't destroy it. So take that, mom, 